Good morning, viewers, and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. As all of you know, this spaceport has had a very unique approach to environmental issues, and that is in sharp contrast to other spaceports who have oftentimes found themselves struggling against environmental organizations. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. Um, would you folks be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers, Elizabeth, if we could start with you, please. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Johnson. My job title actually at the moment is uh, External Affairs Manager. However, I have responsibility uh, uh, for Jason, who's our uh, eco ecological environmental cloud works. I also uh, deal with all the um, outside bodies uh, that we deal with, including all the environmental agencies, etc., uh, at the spaceport. And Jason, please. I'm Jason Joffe. I'm the Ecological Clerk of Works. I, um, my job is to take care of the environment uh, while on a launch site and take care of the birds and the otters. And I work under Elizabeth. Thank you very much for joining us today. All right. So one thing, as I mentioned in the introduction here that I have noticed, is that there's a huge distinction um, between what's happening here and what's happening um, at the SpaceX launch facility at Boca Chica. There, they are being sued um, by the Sierra Club and other local environmental organizations for the damage that is being perceived to be done by the launch activities. And in addition to that, there's a local Native American tribe who are also suing them. There's a great deal of local opposition to the spaceport. Can you uh, explain to me how are you managing to do this? How can you set up a spaceport which has lots of perceived threats? People can imagine quite a lot of things that a spaceport might do to the environment. How are you guys changing perception? Well, at the spaceport here in Amst, we're trying to minimize the disruption to anybody and everybody, actually. And um, as far as the environment is concerned, the, the key, I think, is, is communication and being seen to be doing your utmost to protect the environment. In bird breeding season, for instance, we um, hire an ornithologist to walk the site at least twice a week and he logs every single bird, nest, etc. on the site. And it was interesting after year one, we realised that there were even more breeding pairs on the site. Now, what he's managed to do is to not only to raise all of our awareness to everything on site, but get us interested in the wildlife on the site. And I think everybody from the contractors upwards are really uh, doing their best to watch out for any wildlife, whether it be birds, otters, whatever on the site. And, and working as closely as we can with all the agencies, including Nature Scott, uh, and communicating and, and trying to ensure that they, they can see, we're an we're a, a open book, they can see exactly what we're doing, we, we hide nothing, we try to speak regularly to them all and to the local authority, all the departments there as well, on a very regular basis, and I think that's, that's just, I have no idea what is happening in the space boat you're speaking about, but we just do our best here. That's wonderful. Jason, um, you spoke briefly about otters, and, and can you tell me a little bit about the unique um, fauna who, who live here? You know, what is it about Shetland that is different from an environmental standpoint, and what is sensitive, what needs to be preserved? So what we do, um, look, this is my first time also this year doing the environmental, so I'm learning as we go, um, teachings from Elizabeth. Um, and um, basically going forward, like we take care of the waterways as well from any environmental, um, you know, hazards that can um, come through. So that's a big part of Scotland as well as the UK itself. Um, so, and we stay open about it. If there's any um, leakages that happen or anything, you know, we report it or we go and get it tested. Depends on the situation, but so far nothing has happened, but still we keep open open with um, was it nature's concert and um, yeah. 
and SEPA as well. Well, SEPA is more the most important one Damn. for the waterways. And then when it comes to the otters, you know, we take care of them. It's a, you know, they are scheduled. You have an otter cam. And we have the cameras on them as well. Oh, is that so right? We okay. take care of them. Uh, we have an otter license for yeah. the site. We're just about to renew it. And for that, we had an otter specialist on the site um, uh, doing a comp uh, undertaking a survey of the otters on the site. And thankfully, it seems there's plenty of activity. Yeah. They're happy authors on the site. They actually go from one side of the peninsula to the other under a, pa a, a big pipe under the, the, the main road mm -hmm. in the site, and that's where the author cam is. And then there's a bomb crater that's full of fresh water, which they wash in every mm -hmm. day, and they trot off onto the other end side of the peninsula. So we, we do keep an eye on all the wildlife up there and ensure it's doing well and, and Jason is up on site several times a week uh, uh, just checking everything out and although there's only one natural waterway on the site he takes five different samples from different man-made waterways mm -hmm. as well yes. so in terms of now you also you mentioned bomb crater and in, in, yeah. in the midst of what you're talking about a lot of folks actually don't realize that Shetland was an important nerve center for UK military operations in the Second World War is that where the majority of the bomb craters actually come from was the Second World War or was it other yeah, times that's as well correct. That's the peninsula where the spaceport is situated was uh, area base uh, for World War II and my grandfather built a house 16 years before World War II on that site and when uh, the war had came about he had he was asked to move from the site and so yes a lot of the um, monuments um, uh, which Historic Environment Scotland are, uh, have scheduled on the site were from the World War and um, some of them might be buildings, some of them might be bits of brick or metal from the war and bomb craters are, are yes. protected as well. Mm -hmm. And so in their list of, of monuments on the site, there's about 395. So the designers of the spaceport built and designed a spaceport around most of the monuments with minimum disruption wow. to, the, to, the, to the monuments on the site. So that was good. There was two small red brick buildings that we had to remove for launch pad three, and we had we got a specialist up to to do a survey uh, and put together a method statement for removing them carefully uh, and storing them in order to maybe um, reinstate them somewhere else on the site. Yes. Wow. So, I mean, can you tell me about some of the specific both historical and environmental organizations that you've had to deal with, even with Spaceport Cornwall, where the impact was absolutely minuscule? I mean, we're talking about a rocket being launched from a 747 way offshore, and yet there was still a group of protesters, um, sizable actually, at their first launch. What organizations exist here that are trying to protect Shetland, and how how do you maintain your relationship with them and how, how do you manage to keep things so good with them? Well, there's um, Nature Scott, mm -hmm. which is uh, one of the organisations we have to deal with. SEPA, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, they're more concerned with, like, if you imagine the peat coming out of the site or the waterways. waterways. And indeed, um, we have uh, various um, plans and documents in place such as peak management plans and and the construction environmental management plan and uh, traffic management plans. We have so many different uh, policies in place internally to protect all of the, the site from either environmental pollution or um, damage to any of the historical uh, artifacts on the site and indeed we for, when we first started to excavate on the site we had as part of our planning conditions we had um, a team of archaeologists witnessing every bucket of earth that we took out of the site for, for potential archaeological finds 
they didn't find too much until the last bit of the site they excavated <laughs> and then they found a bronze age yeah. uh, cremation site and um, that was very fascinating for all of us I must say we were all very taken with that and, and as they do nowadays they take they completely excavate it and they take away anything of importance to be carbon dated, DNA tested, maybe some of my relatives there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, they have a little bit more work to do with the large stones which alerted them to that find in the first place. They have to have them lifted up and excavate underneath. But it's an area of the site that we think we can leave the stones in situ. We want them to go back in situ and sort of leave it as a monument. Uh, so that's that's kind of cool as well yeah. because yeah, other amazing. developers may have thought get rid of it all and but we're not we don't think like that no. at all up here. That's that's quite amazing, Jason. Um, in regards to, just give me an idea of you know the, a, a number of things that you have to do in order to to handle your responsibilities. I, for example, um, the viewers right now are looking at your huge collection of water bottles that you have on your <laughs> shelf. Um, th tell me about that. What what I mean? You obviously you're taking lots of water samples. What are you looking for? And you know, and uh, what would be and set off alarm bells with you? Well, um, when I take my water samples, I'm basically looking for any hazardous um, contamination that has entered into the waterway, which should not be there. Reason being is because obviously all the waterways do go to the ocean, but um, so that's why we've got to check weekly on what's happening, especially with construction happening on site on a daily basis. This is why I do it um, on a weekly basis. Uh, what I'm trying to find for is any um, spillages of oil, petroleum, diesel, um, anything got to do with hazardous materials from the locks, anything that's going to seep into the waterways that can potentially harm the environment. This is why we do those water collections. Now, I don't know if you guys have explored, and you know, I ask difficult questions on this channel sometimes, I don't know if you guys have explored this, I'm sure there's been studies made. If God forbid the RFA one explodes right as it's taking off from the pad or something, which rockets have done in the past. What do you anticipate? Um, you know, I mean, what have you? What do you think the, the damage might be? And what are your plans to for cleanup should that occur? I mean, obviously we hope it doesn't, but sometimes rockets do explode. Well, hopefully that that doesn't happen. I mean. Um, Luckily where the launch pads are, there's not many uh, buildings except uh, in close proximity. So, and, and we, we have a, a team that would be mobilized to, to clean everything up. Um, in anticipation of anything uh, disturbing any of the buildings actually, during the hot fire engine tests, we have an array of, of equipment set up to test for vibration, mm -hmm. uh, noise, yes. and uh, we have uh, cameras on the bird life. So mm. we're, we're sort of um, preempting a launch by doing all these monitoring mm. uh, exercises prior to a launch yes. so that even if the launch goes as planned and there's, there's nothing bad that happens as you mentioned, um, we're satisfied that we're doing no harm to the, to, to the uh, wildlife or the buildings on the site. Fantastic. So last question, um, and this is kind of for the both of you. We'll, we'll start with you, Elizabeth. I, I, I'm, I'm picking up that you're a native, a Shetland native, and that uh, generations of your family have lived here. How does all of this make you feel, this, this amazing transformation, this amazing spaceport being added here? I, I, you know, what sort of feelings has this made, uh, created with you? Well, we're on an island furthest north in the UK and traditionally we've had the RAF here and that was hundreds more people in a big industry if you like on the island because there was a lot of support uh, needed for the, the, the uh, RAF being on the island. We also have an airport on the island which when it was fully functional and operating it was 
hundreds of thousands of people a year were being transferred from the North Sea Oil Rigs to, to here uh, and then to Aberdeen. So we've had all these large sort of industries on the island in the past. And to be honest, it was devastating for the island. The population halved when the RAF pulled out in the airport shop. So we are absolutely delighted to have this new industry on the island, to have more young people coming to the island to work to have more support for all the infrastructure on the island, from shops to leisure centres to surgeries. To, uh, yes, uh, absolutely delighted. And it's n uh, nothing new for us to have a new, a different industry on the island with a, a higher population. We need it. And, and also, quite a lot of our eggs were in the aquaculture basket. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to have another industry so that all our eggs employment-wise are not in wind basket. Very exciting. Well, thanks very much for that. And Jason, as far as you're concerned, not from here, I believe. Uh, first of all, where are you from? And how long have you been here? How does this make you feel? So, um, I'm from South Africa. <laughs> I've come three days all the way here. Yeah, so it's been long a, ways. A long journey. But the journey's been absolutely amazing. What I've learned so far, and I've been enjoying every step of the way. This was not in the plan of my life as I never thought I would be here. But sure, what a journey to be here and explore everything and learn everything from people like Elizabeth to others that have uh, degrees that I would never think I would ever have of. But I'm learning from them on a daily basis and going forward and just sponging off of them everything I need. <laughs> so that's the one thing I'm doing to learn everything in this industry to become complete. You know, the next generation is myself and others. Yeah. So we've got to push forward. You know, is ECAR, ECAR is one of the main things that are, um, I've learned and it's been such a learning experience here. Fantastic. Well, folks, really appreciate uh, your, your uh, willingness to be interviewed today. Um, I'm really hoping that the information you've conveyed today may inspire other spaceports to see their relationship with environmental organizations in, through a different sort of lens, that, it, it, that it, there is potential for collaboration instead of conflict. So thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So clearly, RFA-1 is not a monster rocket like Starship, nor is Saxavord Spaceport nearly as big of an operation as Boca Chica, but as you heard me mention in the interview, even Spaceport Cornwall, which caused virtually no problems whatsoever to the environment, even they faced opposition, whereas this spaceport has not. And Elon, I think this is a great opportunity to actually reach out to all these organizations who are suing you to see if any common ground can be found. Listen to them, listen to their concerns, and see whether or not a compromise can be struck whereby the concerns of these environmentalists can at least be addressed while keeping Boca Chica operational. Might not work, but it's worth a try. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.